If the U.S. was a company on the New York Stock Exchange, you know, they would be called a zombie company. The revenues, which is which is the taxes, and it's not really revenue, it's just they're, ta- they're taxing our productivity. They're not producing anything. But those taxes are being overwhelmed by the mandatory expenses. So it doesn't take a, a math genius to see that just on the mandatory expenses, we're $1.5 trillion in deficit. James Lavish, founder and managing partner of the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund and also author of the must-read newsletter, The Informationist. It is so great to welcome you back on the show. And James, great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Julia. It's uh, always good to talk to you. Well, I'm really excited to have you on, especially I feel like there's so much to talk about these days. And let's just start where I always start with my guest, and that is to get your big picture, you know, macro view, the framework in which you're looking at the world today. And one of the things about this show, as you know, James, you can take all the time you need to set the table when it comes to that macro view. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, look, we've we've been in this period where there's a lot of confusion out there, right? Uh, you when you when you see the data that we have coming out of the BLS or the whatever the Fed is looking at out of uh, ISM or some of the other. Um, you know, uh, surveys at Michigan or the Fed surveys themselves, which I, I wrote about, we'll get to in a minute. But um, you have you have this this data that looks pretty good, you know, um, that the economy is kind of rolling along. Uh, the Fed can keep interest rates higher for longer, as they keep saying. Um, but then on the other side of it, you you talk to people and you're and you actually talk to people who are not in the top one or 0.1 percent of of wealth in this nation, and they're struggling. And they're really struggling because of of inflation. Their wages are not keeping up with actual inflation. So the numbers that we're being told, I mean, they're they're manipulated. They're highly manipulated. So it's um, and we can get into that a little bit later too. But there's just this feeling that there are pockets of recession out there that are not being accounted for. And so what it comes down to on the big picture, and we, we, I've been talking about this for a little while, you hear Lynn Alden talk about it quite a bit, is that there's a fiscal dominance that's going on. What does that mean? That means that the government is spending so much money that they are dominating the, uh, the monetary landscape so that the Fed, whatever they're doing, which is raising interest rates and, um, and instituting QT, quantitative tidying, is, tightening, selling some of the assets off of their balance sheet, uh, which should be, uh, that should be restrictive. Both those actions should restrict the economy. But we're finding that it's in, in a lot of areas, it's just not. And the reason for that is, again, because the government is operating in, in massive deficit right now. And those deficits are overwhelming the Fed's work, which is to control inflation. And, uh, and so you've seen inflation, come, it, it, it spiked all the way up above 9%. It's come back down, but it's kind of uh, bottomed out around the 3% uh, range for the last number of months. And it's just stuck there. And people are confused. They're like, why is there still inflation while it feels like the, the economy is not really rolling along what's going on? Well, you know, you have that asset inflation, it's sticky. Um, and that, that fiscal dominance is just exacerbating that. So now we're looking at it and we're, we're, we're getting measures that are looking like the economy is kind of slowing down. You know, the, the GDP, the Atlanta Fed just revised GDP down to 1.8%, which is, that's not great. You know, um, you, need, you, need, you need more expansion for the economy to, to be healthy. And uh, so you're starting to hear people talk about that, that really ugly word that, you're too young to remember, but I experienced in, in my childhood in the 70s and 80s, which is stagflation. Mm-hmm. And it's an it's an absolutely awful situation for the Fed to find itself in. And that's kind of where we're standing right now. Wow. Great frame up. So many things that I would love to uh, dive in further on. Um, I'm just going to go through some of them. Uh, you mentioned some of the numbers we're being told are highly manipulated. I think our audience would love to hear more on that. They might be feeling the exact same way. Can you elaborate a bit more there? Yeah, I mean, so when you hear the Fed talk about inflation, they always they they typically will refer to CPI and the consumer price index. And what that is, it it focuses in on uh, urban areas 
And, uh, and it's supposed to, back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s, it, it would measure a basket of goods and just continually measure that from period to period. But over time, they changed that. And they changed it so they could take, they, they could have goods that are put in there that, are, that would, could be substituted for other goods. So for instance, if you're, you know, if steaks are too expensive, and you suddenly start, they start seeing that people have moved away from buying steaks and now they're buying ground beef, then they're going to switch. They, they can switch it. They can take steak out and put ground beef in and, and, uh, and then just measure those periods instead. And so, uh, and you're, you're seeing that in, uh, in a number of goods. And, uh, and then they have things like housing equivalent. So instead of, instead of putting actual, um, actual, rent in there they'll 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 have an equivalent rent and so it it's just it what they're doing and what it comes down to really big picture julia is look the fed has two mandates right the fed has a mandate to number one have 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 steady prices right so they want stable pricing is what their mandate is number one and number two is full employment so stable pricing what does that mean well, when, when he's asked about it, Powell and other Fed chairmen have, have stated this many times before. Well, their goal is to have 2% inflation. And just let that sit there for a second. And when we were, we were growing up, we we're told that 2% inflation is typical. That's normal. And it's absolutely nothing but abnormal. It is not normal. It is, it, it is, there's nothing that is typical about it. And there's no real reason for it except one thing. And that one thing is they need to inflate GDP nominally. So it's fake production. And how do they do that? They expand the money supply. And so if you look back since the 1970s, since we came off, officially came off the gold standard under Nixon, the money supply has expanded at a closer to 7, 7.1%. Versus inflation that they're they're saying is somewhere around two percent. It's just it doesn't add up, right? So when you look at the prices of goods from year to year, everybody's feeling it. You go into the grocery market, you cannot tell me that prices are three percent higher than they were last year. There's just no way. Yeah, my my bill is not three percent higher. It's thirty percent higher. You know, it's just not. It's 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 ridiculous, and and it's it's a form of gaslighting. What are they doing? Well. They're, what they're doing is the, fan, the Fed's mandate, again, stable pricing and full employment, is really, it, it comes down to when you go to first principles, the first principle is, why are they doing this? Why? When asked about it on 60 Minutes just a, a couple of months ago, Fed, uh, the Fed chairman, Powell, gave a kind of a word salad 90 second answer that made no sense. And it came down to it's just what we've always done. Well, but what does that mean? Why are they doing that? Well, they're what they're doing is they're they're allowing for inflation that they can get away with. They know they can get away with two percent, and people are not going to they're not going to protest and riot over that. But it starts creeping up to five, six, seven, eight, nine percent, and you know, in just a few years, your your purchasing power has decreased by over fifty percent. Then they're going to have a problem, and they're going to have a problem selling bonds. And that's what it really comes down to. So all of this charade comes down to the strength of the treasury bonds because we are uh, we operate in a deficit and we must continue to borrow. And the only way to borrow is by issuing treasuries. And so we need the world to buy our treasuries. Now, if the world is looking at us and saying, well, if I buy your treasury and it's yielding five, six, seven percent, which right now they're only yielding between four and five percent, but if it's yielding five percent, and your inflation is closer to 10%, well, that's a bad deal for me because I'm going to give you money. You're going to give me 5% every year. I'm going to get that money back, that principal back. And in, in 10 years, my purchasing power is going to be down by over 50%. And that's, not, that's a bad trade. And so you're going to see that, uh, that in, nations will turn away from the dollar because of inflation problems. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to first principles, just install that confidence in the U.S. dollar. That's why those mandates are there. It's not to protect the U.S. customer or consumer. It's to protect the U.S. dollar, to protect the treasury. And that's just the, the simplicity of it. It's just reality.
Yeah. As you pointed out earlier, this we're operating at a massive deficit right now. It's overwhelming the Fed's work and also makes me kind of wonder, like, the state of the economy, is it a bit, because it's like being a bit propped up, it's not really where it would be if you just, like, I, I kind of want to just hear more on that side of things, like, maybe yeah, that's a good, the role yeah, of the it, deficit and what it, what that's doing and where that could be pushing us going forward. It's, re- I mean, it's real, it's real spending. And they're real jobs. So if you look at the jobs, a massive amount of jobs have come out of uh, of Washington and out of not just federal but state government um, hiring. And that so they're real jobs, but they're not they're not in the private sector. And so and those jobs require more borrowing to pay for those those uh, those positions and those salaries. Because they're not really they're not really creating productivity like the private sector does. So if you're spending money in the private sector, then you're expanding your your actual production, right? So your production, meaning you're you're producing goods and services that both domestic and foreign people are paying for here, and you're creating GDP, right? So that GDP is is basically what we're taxing. And those taxes are what is paying for all these uh, all these goods and services coming out of the government. So if you just walk through the numbers, just to give people an idea of, of what we're talking about here. If you look at where, where we are now, in 2024, we're running about um, about $6.5 trillion of, of expenses is, is, is what, that's about what we're, what we expect to spend this year, $6.5 trillion, right? So the issue here, though, is that we're only taking in, we only expect to take in about $4.4 trillion of of taxes. Okay, so that means that we're running a deficit of over $2 trillion, $2.1 trillion. So what do they do? Well, and, and why is that? I mean, this is this is comes into what the debt spiral is. And I wrote about this, God, it's it's over two years ago now that the that we're watching this. It's about two years ago now that I that I wrote this piece uh, that's on my that's on my Substack that we're in a position now that we have we're we're spiraling with our debt. What does that mean? Well, if the U.S. was a company on the New York Stock Exchange, right? And this is a this is a it's a great example because they're not a company. They 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 don't actually have any products and services, and they they can actually they can print money. But that's that's part of this whole situation. They would. You know they would be called a zombie company. And why is that? It's because the the revenues, which is which is the taxes, and it's not really revenue. It's just they're take, they're taxing our productivity. They're not producing anything, but those taxes are being overwhelmed by the mandatory expenses. Right. So the mandatory expenses are things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and those those add up to over four trillion dollars. We'll call it four point one trillion dollars. Then you've got your defense spending, which is about nine hundred billion dollars that we know of, and then you've got your net ex- net net interest on your uh, interest expense, which is the debt, the federal debt. And there's intergovernment debt, so there's some interest that comes back, but the outlay is about nine hundred billion dollars. So you'll see people quote that, yeah, we're spending, we're we're paying over a trillion dollars of interest, but we are getting some of that back. But all of that adds up to just under $6 trillion of mandatory expenses, $5.9 trillion. So it doesn't take a, a math genius to see that just on the mandatory expenses, we're $1.5 trillion in deficit, right? And so that leaves the discretionary spending of about five or $600 billion added on top of it. There's your $2 trillion, $2.1 trillion deficit. So what do we do? Well, even if we cut expenses, Julia, we can't cut deep enough in to cover that that gap because we're at a, we're already at a one point five trillion dollar gap on mandatory expenses. These are these are expenses that are signed into legislation. They have to pay them unless they change legislation and say, "Well, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I know we have a lot of boomers that are retiring right now, but you're not going to get full Social Security." So this is why in the mid twenty 20- 30s, we pretty we the Social Security fund is depleted. It 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 goes to zero. So that means that when I retire, retire, when I get my Social Security, I'm only getting I'm only going to get somewhere between 70 and 75 cents on the dollar. 
Why is that? Because they, they've run out of money. That that fund will be depleted. These are the issues that that the government is facing. So what do they do in to to cover that? Well, they issue more debt. They borrow. That's what they're doing. They're borrowing more money every single year and operating almost $2 trillion, probably over $2 trillion deficit this year, I expect. And at a time, Julia, that we're not even in officially in a recession. We're not in wartime. This isn't, we're not extreme problems. We haven't, you, typically you'll see that happen after we've hit a recession, but we're not even in a recession. We're just spending like mad. And so that's the issue is that as we spend more, as those deficits increase, the interest expense on our debt increases. We have to borrow more money to cover that interest expense. Inflation rises because it's inflationary to, to run deficits, run fiscal deficits. The Fed has to keep interest rates high, which causes more interest expense as, as the debt matures off the books of, of um, the, the government has to pay down that principle that debt matures. They have to borrow at even higher rates, which raises the interest expense even more. And you just enter this debt spiral. And there's really, there's no way out of it except to go through a painful period, right? To, to have, to allow for a hard recession. But that again, if you have a recession and which is, this is really important for people to, to understand is that I'm not a debt doomer. I'm more of a, I, I, I raise flags and I raise awareness around the debt. But why do I do that? Because I know that the only way we can we can handle this, the U.S. can handle this, is by printing more money. They, the, you know, they printed over six trillion dollars last time. They're going to print so much money; it's going to it's going to shock people. Why will they do that? Well, if we hit a recession, typically your your int, your the amount of money that the government is taking in on tax revenue will drop by somewhere north of 20%, right? But let's just call it an average of 10% over the last number of recessions. It's higher than that, but let's just call it 10%. Well, now you're going to take in less than $4 trillion of, of taxes, but your expenses go up by at least 10%, 10 to 12%. So now you're talking about instead of spending $6 trillion, $6.5 trillion, now you're spending over $7 trillion. So now your, your deficits just blew out to over $3 trillion. So now you have to borrow more money and issue more debt. And so it just makes the situation worse, right? So what are they going to do? Well, they don't, they don't want us to get into recession and have a collapse of banks. We just saw that there's over half a trillion dollars of, of uh, marked losses, marked to market losses on, on these banks' balance sheets. And because of uh, because of the the rise in interest rates and how the debt how their the debt they have in their books is worth less, so as interest rates go up, the mark to market of a bond goes down. So that's a problem. They can't let these they can't let a, a, a us have a system wide collapse of our financial you know our financial um, system our banks. So what will they do? Well, they'll print more money. They'll enter the market and buy bonds and keep that treasury market extremely liquid because it, you cannot have disruption there. If we have disruption there, it could be catastrophic. And they understand that, so they will print money. So that only means that the, mo the, the money supply expands, inflation continues. So if you're in, you, that's why I keep telling people, own hard money, own hard assets. And we're talking about gold, silver, Bitcoin. Real estate will probably do just fine, but you know you have to own something that will protect you from long-term structural inflation, and that's kind of the message. I'm going to come back to like what to own in this environment, but you even mentioned at the top of the conversation, we are going to have problems selling our bonds. So I want to just kind of tease that out further. Are we already starting to have some of those issues crop up as it relates to selling our bonds? And what are going to be some of the factors that are going to be especially problematic? Like, I imagine, like, we're going to, are we just going to have to print money and buy them ourselves? Like, walk us through how this works um, on the bond market side. Yeah. So, uh, we are seeing, we, we've seen weakness in a number of, of uh, auctions over the last six months, call it. 
And so you had a bad 30 year auction, you had a bad 20 year auction, you had a bad 10 year auction. We had a, 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 a host of, of kind of soft auctions this past week. I haven't looked deeply into them because I was off grid last week, but um, so, but we have seen issues crop up with our, with our uh, auctions. What does that mean? Well, it just means the demand is down and really it means that the foreign demand has dropped and if foreign demand has dropped, um, which some of that includes hedge funds that are offshore, but for all intents and purposes, if that's the case, then the issue is that the primary dealers who are the, they're, they're the Sotheby's of the, they're like the auction houses, right? So they, they auction off this, uh, these, these bonds for the treasury and they agree to buy whatever the treasury doesn't sell in the market, the price that they need. So they get saddled with all this debt and there's only so much debt that they can, they can be saddled with. So what are they, how do they deal with this? Well, you just saw this, this letter from ISDA. It's the uh, international, um, it's the derivatives association basically. And so what they, what they asked for and what they're basically, um, what they're recommending is that the that the Fed remove treasuries from the the calculation of uh, of how lever- the leverage calculation for banks. So if they remove the treasuries and say, well, they're riskless, then they can own as much as they want, and it will not they will not apply to their leverage calculations. And well, they need that basically. The banks don't mind it because it'll allow to have more and more. Uh, leverage in their and on, on their books, and so um, that's that's kind of one thing. The other thing is, you hear the Fed talk about liquidity at the end of the press conferences, typically maybe a little bit in the end of their of their statement, but really when the press conference, they 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 will ask about it a little bit. And we've heard we've heard uh, Powell say that, look, we we start to get worried when the banks bank reserves are down under 2.7 trillion dollars 2.5 trillion dollars and it really comes out to a calculation of gdp which is about 2.7 trillion and when there's no more when there's no more reverse repo left right so that's the extra cash that's been sloshing around the system for the last number of years and it's down under 400 billion dollars but that's been drawn. It's been the the treasury's been drawing that out, issuing T bills. Then they're just they're just soaking that up by by offering a higher rate than the than the reverse, the reverse repo market is offering. So then when they when they draw that out and when that goes down to zero, and the bank reserves are down under two point seven trillion dollars, which they're above three now. They're about three point four trillion, I believe. And so when those are when that's gone. Because the treasury, what the once the reverse repo is is drained out, then the treasury is going to be forced to move on the curve and 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 auction off larger quantities of ten year, twenty year, thirty year bonds, right? Because they've got to they've got to issue notes and bonds in order to uh, in order to to find capital to buy those bonds. The reverse repo won't be there anymore. So what does that mean? That means that they once they get down to that $2.7 trillion, they get really nervous. Why do they get nervous? Well, if you remember back in 2019, we had a repo crisis. We had a repo rate. Why is that? Well, the the Treasury and the Fed kind of they they kind of stumbled in, in September of 2019. What happened was right when corporations were uh were drawing money down to uh to make their tax payments. Right? So they're taking money out of reserves to, to pay their taxes at the same time that the, the treasury expanded the amount of treasuries that were, they were going to auction. And you saw that there was just not enough of the could be for those auctions. And so the, re, the repo market spiked. That means that banks and companies, hedge funds, companies who have treasuries, that they need cash. They, they, they're using it as a cash proxy because, you know, it, it, it's, they're supposedly riskless and they can just offload them to another bank or um, somewhere 
in the financial system, another hedge fund through a bank, whatever. They're they're using that to get cash, right? But when there's not enough cash in the system, then the repo rate spikes, meaning, well, they're going to have to pay a higher rate to borrow that cash. And that's what happened. And it started to affect the treasury market and it became a little bit dysfunctional. And that's when you saw the Fed come in and start issuing QE again, when we weren't even in a major problem. There wasn't a a market crash. We weren't in COVID yet. This is September 2019. And they had to step in and, and expand their QE program to buy assets themselves in order to, meaning treasuries themselves, in order to put liquidity into the market. So that's what they're trying to avoid. And they can't have that. Because if they have a if they have disruption in the market now, there's so much leverage in the system, it could be catastrophic. So they're going to avoid that at all costs. And they'll do things behind the scenes to try to make sure that we don't end up in that situation, which is things like the BTFP, right? The bank term funding program last year when we saw um when we saw Silicon Valley collapse, they instituted that program because they knew that, oh God, there's a lot of banks that are in this situation. Let's give them a lifeline. And so that was what that was, a lifeline. And so you're, you're, you're going to see things like this happen. We'll hear more acronyms. We'll get more programs. Uh, but the, what primarily what first is going to happen is the Fed's going to start uh, backing off of QE or the QT. Um, they're going to stop selling as many treasuries and mortgage backs off their books, which we've already seen that they backed it off over 50%. So they were going to back it down to $30 um, billion a month, and now it's only $20 trillion or $25 trillion. So they backed it off more than 50% of what they were doing before. And so they're concerned. They're concerned about liquidity. And that's kind of what we're seeing. We're hearing that's what I'm watching for. And I'm watching these treasury auctions carefully to see if there's disruption in them, because that just means that there's going to be more liquidity, expansion of the money supply, and inflation on assets. Yeah. All right. Uh, When I was listening to you earlier at the top of the conversation, taking notes, which I feel like I'm learning so much from you, James, and you're so great at explaining things. You mentioned the ugly word stagflation, which historically has been like the worst environment for like pretty much all asset classes. Can I just hear more on your um, outlook? Like, do you see a recession coming anytime soon? I know we were talking about red flags and then this stagflation thesis as well. And then We'll get into like allocation after that. So stagflation, what is that? Well, it's when you have inflation in an environment that the 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 economy is actually contracting. So it's you you've got this or stagnating. So you've got the economy it's not in, it's not expanding. So people are not making more money yet. Prices are going higher. There's a lot of reasons for this, um, and some of it is it, a lot of what we we're seeing right now is that there's there's fiscal dominance that the government is spending massive amounts of money and uh and they're it's inflationary and so but companies are not they're not feeling that that expansion in in their productivity and so there are a lot of different things you can look at uh but we're starting to see numbers that are kind of they're they're kind of um, stagnating the my manufacturing numbers, ISM, and then we just had this report out from um, from Dallas last week that I that I wrote about in in newsletter also. But basically, what it's saying is that companies, first of all, this this report um, is out of Dallas, and you've got different reports that come out of Chicago and Kansas City, and then they they measure different things and and productivity, manufacturing, all that, but. The, the Dallas report has 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 three uh, parts to it. It's manufacturing, it's uh, services, and it's retail. And so they talk to the companies, they survey them and ask them, how's it going? What are you seeing? What's going on? And you start getting uh, you start getting this data back and the data doesn't look great, right? So it's uh, it looks like it's it the the activity and their outlook is decreasing. Right, so it's going down over the last 24 months. It's just been decreasing for like 20, 22 months in a, in a row. It's just been, it's been on a in a decline, and so that means that because their their answers were 
we're experiencing higher input prices, raw goods, raw materials, um, wages. We have to start, we, we're trying to get our employees caught up to all the inflation that's occurred. And it's, it's causing us to spend more money in order to catch them up, but we're at our limit now. Uh, we can't raise prices anymore. The, the customer's at their limit. They can't spend anymore on individual goods. And we're seeing that that customers are turning away or they just can't buy them anymore because the goods are, the, the services are too expensive. So um, so that's that's the issue here. And, and so, but we are hearing things on the ground so you'll you'll see, you'll hear these reports. You'll see the mainstream media. You know you'll hear out of the White House. The economy's doing great. Look at all the numbers. Everybody's happy. Everything and everybody's not happy. You know when you when you have sixty some odd percent. I read an article this morning. It's over sixty percent of the current middle class, which is two times the uh, the the lowest income. The uh, they're they're feeling severe pressure fiscally financially they're not fiscally financially they're feeling severe pressure that means that the economy is not doing that great they may be the one the top one percent are doing great but when you when you go down into the demographics and you start splicing it out you see that young people are struggling on credit card bills they're starting on their their auto payments and they're starting to they're starting to default on those that's an issue. So, but then going back to the Dallas Fed survey, which is just one survey, you have to look at all these things holistically, but Texas is the second largest economy in the nation and it's important, right? But when you hear the quotes and the comments that come out of this survey, you hear things over and over again. You hear things seem to be slowing down. Things seem to be slowing down. It's not much fun to be in business right now. Customer volumes are decreasing. Things are in a mess. Trucking is definitely in a recession. Inflation doesn't seem to moderate as much as expected. Interest rates and inflation continue to dominate company decisions. Prices for goods, services remain elevated. Like these are comments that are coming from these these manufacturers. You know, they're talking about that we're on a brink of on the brink of having major staffing cuts. We're certain that we're going to be closing our doors or leasing as many as six employees in the next few months. Higher prices are frustrating our guests. Business just continues to remain volatile. There are storms on the horizon. Inflation is getting pretty scary. And then the, my favorite quote of this uh, of this survey was, "We can't make enough interest on our deposits to cover inflation." Wow. I mean, those are all comments coming out of this report. I mean that that doesn't sound great to me. No. Right. So. Are we spiraling down into recession? No, I don't believe we are because again, going back to that fiscal dominance conversation, the government is spending money in certain areas, infrastructure, green energy, you know, uh, special projects, military. They're spending a lot of money over there. And so that's creating pockets of strength in the economy. But then you've got these pockets of private weakness. Anything that is that is directly um, that is directly affected by high interest rates. Things like commercial real estate, real estate, um, you know, residential real estate. You've got uh, technology companies that have to borrow in order to continue to operate at at the levels they're operating at, and to to uh, invest in in research and development, and to keep paying salaries. We've seen a, a, a massive amount of layoffs in the in the tech sector this la- in the past five months because it it that that in, that those high interest rates are they're affecting these companies and so you're seeing pockets of recession out there while you're seeing pockets of strength and so they're kind of fighting each other and the reality is that the private sector is not doing as great as it, it appears and are we in a recession yet technically no we're not in a recession yet. Are we headed that way? I believe at this point we are headed that way. Um, but I also believe that the the government's going to continue to spend, and and they're going to recklessly spend and expand that deficit if they need to. Particularly because again we're in an election year. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how does the election play into something like this? You know, it's there's not. a lot of pressure on the Fed politically to lower rates. Yet the Fed's going to look they're they're going to look terrible if they lower rates and we continue to have inflation because they're supposed to be the they're supposed to be the policing force on inflation, but they haven't been able to be. It, you know, their their work is being unraveled, undone by the government who's pressuring them to lower rates and they're spending more money. So what do I mm-hmm. believe? I believe we're just going to continue to spend more money and they will do anything they can to avoid a recession. Is the is the Fed political? Technically, no. Do they have tremendous pressure on them from, from certain members of Congress and senators and from the White House? I believe so. I don't know what what Powell ultimately does, but I do know that when we look back at when the Fed cuts rates, they typically overshoot. They overstay their welcome. And what you will see is a spike in unemployment prior to that drop in rates. So you always get a spike of unemployment right before a recession. And so it's too late. It's it's often too late. We enter a recession excuse me, it's right after the, we enter a recession. So we enter a recession and then you get that spike in unemployment. So it's often too late. That's the that's what they're watching for. They're watching that unemployment number because inflation is kind of stuck at 3%. I don't believe it's coming down under that as long as we continue to, to, allow, to spend so much money out of the government. I don't believe it's going to come down. Yeah. We're also recording this before we get the jobs report, the non-farm payrolls on Friday. The- it's Friday, yeah. The FOMC is next week as well. I had Jim Bianco on, James, and he was making a point. I don't know if you follow do, um, yeah. Jim, but he, yeah, I love Jim. He was making a point that like the Fed, if they're going to do something or change in policy, it was like they have to do something in June or that window is going to close until like after the election because we just get too close. It's too political. I mean, and he, they'll be they'll yeah. be seen as the, they could be blamed for the outcome of the election if they do something, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a good point. We just had the JOLTS number came out today, the, you know, the jobs report and uh, the openings fell from, they were expecting almost 8.4 million and they felt it just over 8 million, you know, um, and the March was revised down 100,000. And then I was reading um, Anna Wong, uh, the economist on Bloomberg, she was talking about last year that jobs were likely overstated by almost three quarters of, of a million jobs. And the reason for that is that the 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 measures, uh, the way that the the numbers are are calculated uh, out of the BLS is that they don't include business closures properly. So when a business closes down, they're not including that properly in their numbers. And so the actual job growth has likely this year been more like a hundred thousand versus almost a quarter of a million per month that's being reported. And so she's saying that likely we'll see jobs overstated by a million this year. And so it's just, every time you hear this, you just hear this manipulation, this kind of, it's all of optics. Like, well, how does it look? How does it, I mean, it, it and it confuses people. And that's why when yeah. I talked to, um, my son is 24. You and I were talking about it earlier um, before the show. He's got a job, but he's got friends who are really struggling finding jobs. They're college graduates. Yeah. Str- people are not, companies are not hiring quite as much as they're saying. And then there's another thing that, I was reading about. I don't have. I have anecdotal evidence, but I don't have. Uh, I don't have hard data on it. But there are a lot of companies out there that that are trying to portray strength, and so they have job listings that they're not real jobs. I think there was like a, I want to say there was a piece. I want to say it was like the Wall Street Journal or something. Some they were like not real listings. I almost. I don't want to like say it's Wall Street Journal, but job listings and. Yeah. There, and and when people call up and say, oh, yeah, that's already been filled. or Yeah, Wall Street know, Journal reported last year, uh, job listings abound, but many are fake. That's because companies are, are, are they're trying portray to portray strength. strength. I also wonder if it's like a marketing ploy. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so that's problematic. So, you know, um, yeah. it's hard to tell exactly what's going on in the economy because it's such a, it, we, it's a behemoth of an economy. And so- you can't look at any one number. You have to look at everything holistically. The The issue comes down to when you have so much manipulation and so much bad data or data that's just, that's inconsistent, uh, 
it makes it very difficult to see what's going on. So the best thing to do often is just to talk to people. How's it going? How's your business doing? And when you hear reports like you did out of the Dallas Fed, and you start getting reports like that out of San Francisco, out of Chicago, out of Kansas City, out of New York, then you have, an, then you 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 better wake up because this is reality, and people are telling you what's going on. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, talk to people. Um, okay, I know I've taken so much of your time. I guess like on the way out here, let's do some parting thoughts. Let folks know where they can find you, your work, share what you're up to. Uh, we didn't get to asset allocation. Maybe put that in there as well. Um, anything that you'd like to leave with the audience? The the floor is yours, James. Well, thank you, Julia. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, and it's always good to be here and talk to you. But as I said before, I'm I'm heavily allocated to uh, to hard assets, hard monies like gold, uh, silver, Bitcoin. Uh, I do have my powder that I've got set aside in case we do hit a recession uh, and we have a downturn in the market. I do have powder set aside, but I don't have I'm, I'm, I don't own longer term treasuries. Everything I have is is in short term uh, T bills. And uh, and money markets that own T bills that that give a good interest rate and but are very liquid that I can easily move uh, and and take advantage of of drawdowns. So um, that's really important to me. And uh, and that's that's uh, something I just want people to understand is that when I talk about all this debt, when I talk about the spending, the government spending, I'm really trying to make sure people are aware that they need to own assets. Shouldn't have their money sitting in in their their checking accounts. And you shouldn't be owning long bonds, in my opinion. Everybody's different. Everybody's got their own uh, their own situation. They have to talk to their advisor. Obviously, I can't give individual advice here, but that's what I'm doing. So, um, where am I? I'm, I'm active on Twitter. Uh, I have a uh, as as you said before. I'm managing partner along with uh, uh, David Foley and the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, and we are investing in Bitcoin the Bitcoin ecosystem and Bitcoin uh, specific opportunities. And there's a, there's a host of, of those. The fund is closed. We're not taking any more investors right now, but we will likely see a lot more opportunity in the future and have another one. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've got a newsletter that I wrote, wrote um, that I write every week. It's called the informationist. Uh, there's a free version and there's a paid version. And, uh, but all that is just, uh, it takes one financial concept and it simplifies it for people so they understand what's going on and how to look at these things and all these acronyms and and concepts people you hear the 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 uh, talking heads and uh, experts uh talk about uh every day so it gives it makes them i the goal is to make people uh-huh. feel and and be financially smarter that's why i love talking to you is you can distill these complex topics for any audience and so that's i just love having you on and i'm so grateful um for you taking the time today james lavish founder managing partner of the bitcoin fund author of the informationist thank you for being so generous with your time your ideas all of your knowledge i really appreciate you james well thank you for having me julia i look back look forward to the next time <laughs>